Good morning. Our text for this morning is from the book of Job, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Then Eliphaz the Tenemite answered, If one ventures a word with you, will you be offended? But who can keep from speaking? See, you have instructed many. You have strengthened the weak hand. Your words have supported those who were stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knee. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence? and the integrity of your ways, your hope. Think now, who that was innocent ever perished, or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same by the breath of God that perished and by the blast of his anger, they are consumed. Here is the reading from the book of Job this morning. May God grant God's blessing in our hearing. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. With friends like these, well, you know the rest of that familiar saying. To these familiar words attributed to the 20th century Hoboken, New Jersey comedian, Joey Adams, Job would have uttered a confirming, you can say that again and double it. Poor Job, poor, poor Job, blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Not just my opinion, the Bible tells me so. Chapter 1, verse 1, can't miss it. He was a doggone good guy, really. The Bible book of his name says it twice. Just a short seven verses later we read, The Lord said to the accuser, a.k.a. the Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Actually, the Job book says it a third time. Read from chapter 2, verse 3. The guy is a nice guy. Anyone would love to have this blameless and upright believer as a neighbor or a friend. If you were a hungry stranger, Job would most certainly give you a piece of bread or two and a glass of water. It doesn't say that in the Bible, that a man who is upright and fears God wasn't, would not hesitate twice to show his love for a neighbor, especially a strange neighbor. Then, suddenly, out of the clear blue, blue skies of life. Job, this really great guy, an upright man of faith, well, his life is dropped without any warning into a totally, unconditionally, undeserving abyss. It was a storm of life's storms that flattened him that crushed his bones into the earth. 
a storm that would rip apart and dissolve any hope, undo any faith in a merciful, loving, compassionate Creator. For anyone who ever walked the face of planet Earth during the thousands and thousands of years of human habitation, Until that life-crushing storm hit, Job was living a pretty idyllic life for the times. There were born to him seven daughters, uh, seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants. Sounds like quite the estate. Then the book of Job tells us, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. The greatest of all the people of the East. And then, and then, and then God allowed the floodgates of evil to test Job. It happened like this. One apparently random day, the Satan joined other heavenly beings to drop in on God. Following some small talk, the Satan challenged Job's allegiance to God as one of convenience. After all, the Satan informed God. God gave Job a big family and lots of good stuff. The Satan challenged God to allow him to rip away Job's safety net and rip Job's life to shreds and see then how much appreciation Job would show God. God accepted the challenge and told the Satan, very well, all that he has is in your power. <clears throat> Armed with a cart Blanche realm of destructive options, the Satan went to work. He went to work on Job's family and homestead. Shortly thereafter, messengers came to Job and laid some real misery at the soul of this blameless and upright man who feared God. Job was told by the messengers the fire of God fell from heaven, and you have lost your donkeys and camels and oxen and servants and sheep, and, and you have lost your sons and daughters. They are dead. A lot to take in for one day. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. In spite of, or maybe because of, his unflinching loyalty to God, Job needed a friend. Three friends, buddies you might say, all answered the ringing of the bell of a friend in need. They came together to hopefully provide some comfort. But as Elias Faz tells Job from this morning's scripture reading, he says to Job, Job, think now, who that was, ever, who, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Not very comforting words. 
Likewise, Bildad turns the blame away from God to Job and tells his friend he should repent. Then friend number three really drives the dagger into Job when he says, Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. That needs repeating and a little rewording. Bildad tells Job whatever sin Job committed, God went easy on him by taking away all he had, including his seven sons and three daughters. Talk about hitting their friend right between the eyes. Not much comfy, cozy, compassionate talk there. Job, the good man and straight shooter, has not only lost his children and all he owned, but his friends blame Job's unnamed sins for his misery. Job needs a friend, a real friend. As Dr. Amy McLaughlin Sheesby, assistant professor at Abilene Christian University, tells us, Job has become a man coming unraveled in grief. He begs his friends to believe him, to bear witness to his suffering. Job longs for someone to see and hear his wounds, because there in his wounds is an important truth. truth. The suffering we experience in this life exerts a chaotic, baffling, theology-defying force upon us. We wish only that we do not endure it alone. We wish only that we do not endure it alone. That requires a friend a good friend. Job is a very difficult book to grasp. It is a book of many twists and turns, of many angles for many sermons. But I want to focus on just one aspect of the book of Job this morning, the aspect of finding a friend, whether it is for Job or for us. Job needs a friend, and so do we, in good times and in not so good times. Friends are not so always so easy to find. Job needed a friend, a real friend, someone, even just one friend, that would listen and try not to shame him or blame him. That applies to all of us in times of trouble. If the sky above you grows dark and full of clouds, and that old north wind begins to blow, keep your head together and call my name out loud. Soon, you'll hear me knocking at your door. In the course of time, we all need that friend about whom James Taylor wrote. The challenge here for Job is, what name shall he call out? The three friends that came run and also did a lot of blaming and not much compassion shown. How about us? Where can we, like Job, find a friend? Someone to talk to that will just listen and not judge or offer advice 
when times are rough. As the Love and Spoonful sang, it is so vital to our mental well-being to find a friend for that great relief in having a friend to talk to. It has taken me precisely 77 years, 7 months, and 236 days since the day my eyes were opened to this world back in Teaneck, New Jersey in 46. It took that time to come to a new life awareness reckoning. A reckoning about important, and I stress the word important, time in our Sunday morning worship that many take sort of casually. I have. 30 to maybe 45 minutes, give or take a few minutes, of our time of weekly devotion. For you and me, and for me, not just as a pastor, although that certainly is taken into account. This time, again, I more acutely recognize a vital part of a total package of worship, time to expand our understanding of God's greatest commandment, that is, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be a friend. These precious minutes which follow our service just down the hall to the right and then to the left are special moments to help us reinforce the bond we share as fellow Christ Christians. To reinforce our bonds of friendship we have and to find new friends. It is a blessing and grace afforded our weekly time together to appreciate all that God has given and continues to give, follows our morning time together in the sanctuary. And what is the message that I hope and pray you take with you as you leave our home of Christian worship this morning? Who am I to try to understand all that God does? Why do the innocent suffer? What I do know is that just as God brought Adam and Eve together for companionship and worked toward completion of God's creation, God knew that we were not meant to be alone, that we needed friends, and friends we can find every Sunday, just down the hall, <coughs> to the right and then to the left, and shuffle on in and find a seat and grab some food and chat. And there are plenty of ears to listen. One final Christian thought. To help others find a friend, maybe we could start by being a friend. Amen.
And now for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>